All right, here we are here in uh, Dade City, Florida with Frank Mays, who uh, when he was, was it 26 years old? Yes. 26 years old, was, uh, was a deck watchman on the Carl D. Bradley, which uh, ultimately sunk on November 18, 1958. And so we're just here today, we're gonna kind of talk and tell the story from uh, sort of from start to finish and maybe uh, reveal some new um, details about the, the accident in itself. So so the first thing you guys, let's see, you guys left Cedarville, right? With a full load heading uh, towards Buffington? No, we left Calcite, Michigan. Okay. With a full load to Gary, Indiana. Okay, so when you're in Gary, did you guys hear anything about a storm coming? Not to my knowledge at the time. Okay, and you guys left about 9.30, right, from Buffington? 9.30 on November 17th. Okay. 9.30 p.m. Okay, so you leave Buffington 9.30, and then you guys are headed to Dry Dock and to Manitowoc, right? To Manitowoc, Wisconsin, to tie up for the, for the season. We were done. That was our last load. Okay. So at that point, you get to Manitowoc, the, your, the season's done, you get in a van and you go back to Rogers City exactly. and start winter work. Okay, so in your shift as the deck watch, you were four till eight, right, at night and, and in the morning? In the morning, yes. Okay, so you get done at uh, eight o'clock on November 18th? No, November 17th. November 17th, okay. Well, and you see, when you unload on these ships, the deck crew works two hours before their watch and two hours after their watch for overtime. So my watch was four to eight. So I went on watch at four, I worked till eight, and then I worked till 9.30 to finish unloading. And at 9.30, I was done for the day. Okay. 9.30 p.m. on November 17th. On November 17th. But then the following morning, you went in at four. Yeah, the following morning, I got up at 3.30. I went to the, I went aft to the galley to get coffee for the pilot house, the uh, wheelsman and the mate. And when I was walking down the port side, I could see all of the lights on the Wisconsin shoreline. So the first thing to get into the galley, other guys are in there, and the word is out. We're on time. We're scheduled to arrive at Manitowoc about 2.30 this afternoon on November the 18th, and we should be tied up. And I thought, well, that's good because I don't go to work till four o'clock and I don't have to do all the tying up. At my shift, we'd start laying up the boat for the year, which would take possibly two days, maybe three days for the forward in, and then I would be on my way back to Roger City. What, what kind of process was that to tie up the Bradley? Well, they had to, uh, if I can remember right, they have to put both hooks, that is both anchors down, and drag them ashore then they have to double up on all of the lines so that it's secured. Because remember, this would be winter time and there will be ice around and they wouldn't want the ship to move any. Okay. But normally, if you just, when you came up on the dock to unload stone? Well, oh, we come up on the dock and just whatever lines you needed were out. Okay. Because you were only out there for about six hours or seven hours unloading. Okay. Hmm. So you get done at. 8 o'clock on the 18th, 8 o'clock in the morning, and then you go take a nap, right? Yeah, I go back to eat breakfast, then go up to the room and uh, probably maybe I had some clothes to wash or something, and uh, took a nap, and then at 3.30, I went down the port side, so I come out of my room, I looked down the port side. Where Your room is in the bow or, or the in the stern? In the bow. It's in the bow, okay. On the port side. Okay. And I come out onto the deck and I look to the right, which would be the port side of, on my right, and all I saw was water, I didn't see land. <laughs> okay. So I crossed to the starboard side and looked, all I saw was water, and right away I didn't know what was going on. Got back to the galley, and that's when they told me that uh, we're going back to Roger City for one more Back load. to the galley at 3.30 on the afternoon, November the 18th. That's when I found out we're going back to Roger City for another load. So uh, I took the coffee up to the pilot house and Elmer said, uh, you don't have to sound the tanks, that is to measure the water in the ballast tanks, because he said we flooded them, which I knew they're completely full, to, so we'd have uh, 
12,000 tons of water as ballast. Who's in the pilot house at this time? Is the captain up there? The captain was up there. Elder. Who's your wheel? Who's your wheelsman? Uh, Togetsky or not? Um, uh, Ray Kowalski. Kowalski, okay. He was a, and Mal Orr was up there, and uh, Gary Price and myself. And that's when Elmer said to uh, Mal Orr, you stay in the pilot house. Gary, you go down to the dunnage room so I know where you're at if I need you. And he told me to go aft check the coal bunker, make sure it's pinned and clamped, because we're going to be in some rough weather. And then he said, remember to sump out the tunnel, which was part of my job. So I did that. I went and I checked the coal bunker. Everything was fine. Went down to the engine room. I visited down there with some fellas. Then down to the stoker room where my neighbor Paul Heller was, and we visited. And then I went through the watertight door, which has big clamps on there called dogs. I went through that and I dogged the door back and being we're riding at an angle, the water that from the ballast tanks were leaking in the tunnel area. So I pushed the button on a pump, sumped all the water out, and I start walking up the tunnel just wasting time. And I could see the ship twist and turn and do all these gyrations and then you'd hear a, a bing, like a rivet popping. And we knew we were picking up buckets of rivers everywhere. Rivets. That was kind of normal, right? Oh, that was yeah. normal. And what did you guys put in, put in place of the rivets? Uh, uh, just bolts. Carriage bolts. Yeah. Carriage bolts. Okay. Stuck in there. Then I got up to the dunnage room, and Gary Price was up there, so we sat down. At that time, I was smoking, and I lit up, and then all of a sudden, we heard the big bang, and the ship shook. What did that? Do you remember what that sounded like? Can you still hear it? Oh, a big thud. It's like because when it broke, you got to visualize a tunnel is completely open all the way through and the sound echoes up back. Right. And we heard that and the ship started to shake, followed by another one, and then we looked at each other and we raced up the ladder, which is a stair we call a ladder, looked back aft on the port side, and where my arm is here is a stern section, it wasn't there. We looked right down the deck, it wasn't there. Then it came up like this. The, the keel broke underneath, it was like on a hinge. Okay. Going up and down. So what we did, turned to our left, went into our rooms, and the overhead as your life jacket. Grabbed that, put it on, looked at the stern on a port What's side. going on on the boat right now? Like, do you see other guys running out, or? Oh, well, on the boat right now, the captain blew abandoned ship. You could hear the whistles going. Okay. And I didn't see anybody other than Gary, who was with me. And when I, we come out on deck and looked at the port side, where the two lifeboats were, Knowing we couldn't get down that way, we crossed to the starboard, and again it didn't look good. And we said, pointing up life raft, so we raced up to the deck near the pilot house where the life raft is. And Gary's and with you? Guys, yeah, Gary's with me. Okay. And other men start coming up and showing up from the forward end. Again, you could see the ship start to tear apart from port to starboard as if you tore a piece of paper. Okay. And Elmer is on the radio phone all the time with his Mayday message. And you were up in the pilot house at this no, time? No, I was on the pilot house deck. Oh, okay. No. Elmer was outside the pilot house in a doorway with the radio phone and looking out and seeing what's going on. Did you hear him yelling in the phone? Oh, yeah. He was saying, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is a Carl D. Bradley. We are 12 miles southwest of Gull Island. We are breaking into and sinking. Anyone in the area, come to our aid. And he kept repeating this until we lost power. Because all the power what, what is it? Is it dark at this time? Is it? It's, it's getting dark. It's yes. Getting dark. You it's still can see a little bit. Well, we could see. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We could see the lights on the stern, but when the cables all snapped, the electrical cables, the forward end went dark, and Elmer had no more power. No, he couldn't speak. Anymore, so he dropped the phone. Just, and I have a video of that. The divers have that showed it just hanging there in a pilot house door, because he went down to his room to retrieve, retrieve his life jacket. Who's who's all up in the pilot house in the in the front of the boat? The, the well, I would venture to say that everybody on the forward end was up there. I don't know. The only person that I saw heading aft was the second mate, John Fogelsander. Do you remember? Okay, so at which point did you get to that life that life uh, raft? When Elmer was on the radio phone, okay, announcing the May days, and then he hollered, "Someone get the life raft ready." And the people alongside of me didn't do nothing, so I jumped on a life raft. Then it was tied down with ropes. 
I untied it, and I was on the life raft. There were now two pieces. Right. And I was on the life raft, and we're rocking back and forth and starting to go down, and we got hit by this huge wave as we tipped to the port side, and I went with the raft into the water. Think back about uh, when John Fogelsonner is running to the back of the, the boat. Do you, do you remember that pretty clearly? Oh, yes, because he come up and the captain, there's a, a couple of steps going up into the pilot house door. The captain was on that level and John was on the main deck and he was talking to John. Then John turned around and raced down the port side and I seen him as it was breaking apart. I seen him jump over to break, but he never made it. You don't think he made it? No. And his body was never recovered. See, I, I believe, and Elmer and I talked about this, we thought maybe the captain told him, go aft and get those life bolts launched. That was his job, so. Uh, okay, so do you remember when the guys, three or four of them, climbed up to the high side? On the oh, I side? see them as we started to list to the port. Do they all have life jackets on? Yes, yeah. Elmer said his life jacket, he just kind of threw over top of them. Do you think most of them had buttoned the, the life jackets down right or just kind of threw it on? Well, I don't know because okay. the life jacket that I had didn't have buttons. It had laces. Okay. And I remember, because if we would have a lifeboat drill, you put your jacket on a tie and a bow knot so you could take it off. But I remember tying mine in a, a knot, a regular knot, it's just so it was tight, not in a bow knot. Now, the other fellows, I don't know. Okay. Because everything was moving pretty fast. What did what did John Fogelsonner have on? Do you remember when he was running? Did he have a jacket on that said his name? Possibly, because John would be on the uh, second mate's watch, would be the uh, 12 to 4. Okay. So he would have gotten off watch at 4 o'clock. Okay. So he would have possibly been fully dressed. Okay. So he leaps. Elmer Fleming wrote in his diaries that he, you could see right into the hold on the aft end of the... Yes. You could? I could see also as the two pieces were separating and the cable was snapping, you could see right into the hold of the stern section. What was that image like for you? Well, that's really hard to say. I just... Because things are moving so fast. Okay. But when we were on the life raft, four of us, the stern section... The bow's gone. The stern was floating even keel. Okay, so you guys get knocked into the water, and you took one paddle, and you hit the life raft, yes. right? Yes. All right, and Elmer was, I think Elmer said he was on the port side, on the low side, and he got thrown in the water, and he was the next one on, right? Yeah, he was the next one closest to. Okay. And I helped him aboard, and then the next person was Gary Strelitzky. Did Elmer said that you he was all you guys were yelling like hell for him to swim. He had to swim real hard to catch that raft. Is that true? Possibly. Okay. And then and then Dennis Meredith comes on last. Yes. Dennis Elmer said that Dennis once he got on the raft didn't say anything. He just laid down yeah. and was so scared and cold that he never said another word. Is that yeah. pretty accurate? That's it. That would, yes because see, Dennis again was on the twelve to four watch. So he'd get done at four, he'd go back and eat his dinner, and lying in his bunk. I remember what he wore. He wore a sweatshirt, khaki pants, and socks. That was it. No that jacket, was all. no shoes. So he could have possibly been lying in his bunk. Okay. So Elmer said that he was huddled up with Dennis Meredith, on the, and then you and Gary were in the corner of the raft. Could that have been true? Possibly. Okay. Yeah. Um. He, Elmer said something about there was some tie rod going across the middle of the raft. Do you remember that, where you could put your hands under? Yeah, there was a rod. That a rod. Would, would hold up what they called a freeboard, which is a board about three inches high around the raft, probably to hold it together, each side, oh, okay. a small one. But we didn't hang on to that. You, they, he said you guys didn't, but he did. Well, what, we, what I did, and I believe what the others, we stuck our fingers down in the between the slats, right, where the rod was tight to the deck. I don't see you get your fingers under the rod. Well, Elmer said he it pinched his fingers all night by doing put, putting his fingers under that rod. Could have, yeah. Okay, so, so you, okay, so the, you only saw, could you hear the guys yelling, the other guys in the water? Oh, yeah, we could hear, not too much, but we were yelling. 
Okay. How do we, we have what were you just raft. saying? We have the life raft? Get yeah. yeah, we're over here. Can you hear us? And just yelling to them. And I saw this one guy on top of a wave with his arms up like this. And he went over the other side. And That was Mel? Yes, Mel Orr. And you're 100% sure? Did yeah. you, okay. Did you yell, hey, Mel? Or did he no, say I, anything? No. We just thought we got the life raft. That's all we say. We had the life raft. I see. We're over here. Just yelling, you know, to get our voices going. But so you guys on the on the raft, you guys were found 17 miles from when the Bradley went down, but the bodies were found 12 miles. So you guys were going faster. Oh well, yeah, and because we were bigger, we caught more wind and more seas. So okay, so once that raft was in the water and you guys were on it, you guys were essentially hauling at. I mean, you guys were getting away from the wreck well, site yeah. very fast. So, um, okay, so and then Elmer explained the raft was spinning. Flipping, I mean, it was doing. It was just a wild ride, right? Well, it was a wild, a wild ride to the fact that we would go up these waves three times. We'd go up and we'd fall, all fall off the raft. The raft would tip over. We'd all fall into the water. He said the good, the only good thing about it all is that you would fall when you came off the raft. You would fall in front of the raft, and the raft would come back to you. Yeah. Is that true? Yeah. 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 It would stay right on the trough of the sea where we could get back on. Okay, so you know that you guys have flares, right? Yes. Okay, Elmer kind of took over that job, yes. right? He said that um, it was in some kind of waterproof canister. I the flares. do not know what the flares are in. Okay, so it was in some waterproof canister, but he had to hold on with one hand, and he couldn't get the top off. So he pressed the can between him and Dennis Meredith, to like squeezed it between their bodies, held on with one hand, and took a flare off. Um, that's how he got the top off. Now, he said that he was kind of torn a little bit because he wanted to wait because he knew the Satori was out there, but he wanted to wait to shoot those off and that uh, you and Gary and everybody were kind of coaxing him to shoot off some flares. Were you guys saying, hey, shoot off the flares? or Do you remember that? No. Okay. So, um, anyway, he shoots off, what, three or four flares? Well, when I go, there was... Three flares, he lit one after he got them out. He lit one and held it up, nothing. And then he lit the second one later on and nothing happened. And then he knew the Satori was out there coming towards us. And we could see the Satori's running lights, the red, green, and the mass light. And Elmer took his last flare. Now remember, we had tipped over. We were back on the water three times, back on the raft. And he took that flare and he stuck it inside of his jacket. And when time came, to, we could see the running lights of the Satori. He took it out and he tried to ignite it, and it would not ignite. And that's when the Satori, we could see, about, uh, she turned. Yeah, she turned to her left, so we could see her red light disappear and her green light become more visible, because you know they sit at a what they call two points about the beam at a ninety degree angle plus two points. Okay. So you only see, they're so designed that you know which way a ship is turning. When one, one, one light disappears and the other light becomes more visible. And the Satori never saw us, never heard us because of the seas and the mist and the, wind, the roar of the sea and she turned right away from us. So uh, Dennis Meredith, uh, was it the second or third time you guys couldn't get him back up, right? Third time we couldn't get him back up, yes. And you still to this day don't really know why he was, was he caught? His life jacket was caught? or? Well, it's kind of hard to say. We just couldn't get him up and he couldn't help us. You know, he was exhausted, hypothermia. He wasn't weak. saying anything, he wasn't talking? or No, he, he couldn't wouldn't talk, no. But so, you and Gary held him there for yeah. a while, right? Yeah, Gary and I, we each took an arm between his, our legs like this and held on. And we'd check on him, and he, we could see he was okay. His head was up, and when I checked on him one time, his head was in, his face was in the water. That's when I picked him up by the hair, and I looked, and his eyes were white. And I looked at Gary. Gary looked at me, and we just let him go. And then I spoke to my doctor about this several years later, and he assured me that Gary, he said that Dennis had already passed away when we let him go. Okay. He said he was already gone. Um, okay, so you guys are going through the night. You, you don't have any idea what time it is. No, because after we tipped over the third time, 
that's when I dug back into the compartment of the raft and I found the, the sea anchor, which I tied onto the raft and threw it over the side. And then we'd go up these waves and a raft would shake a little and go right through a wave because the sea anchor creates a big drag. And that's how we rode so up. So at the some night point there. that sea anchor came off, right? Yeah, it wasn't there come morning time. Okay. And I was asked how did I tie it, and I said I used a bowline knot. And a bowline is made so that the more you pull on the rope, the tighter the knot gets. But being these ropes haven't been used for a while, they could have slacked off when nothing was going on, and we, you know, the drag wasn't there anymore. Because I remember in the morning it was gone. Okay. Um, I think in your testimony you said that water, the waves were coming over top the raft, right? Oh, Just yes. splashing over you and coming up underneath. Uh, well, yes, because that's open underneath, yes. Do you remember what the water, do you remember being told what the water temperature was? They said it was pretty cool because when they found us, we had ice on our bodies. It was 49 degrees. 49 degrees. The sundew had that uh, on their intakes of the engine. Yeah. The water was 49 and the wind was 39. Yeah. Um, okay, so... And what and throughout the night, could you tell? Like Elmer Fleming, in his writing, said he was ready to give up. I mean, did you ever feel that way? No, I didn't, because that's when I had said, and on my book, if we make it till daylight, we will be found. We just had to make it till daylight. Do you remember the planes flying over with the drop in the flares? Oh yes, during the night we could see them. Yes. But you guys were they were way far they're away. From they're you. farther south of us. Okay. Um. All right, so it's coming to morning. You can start to see morning, and then what happens to Gary? Well, Do you remember? I can you remember him laying on the raft? Oh, I remember laying on the raft at that time. We didn't know we couldn't move our arms and legs, Elmer and I. And Gary was laying there, and then all of a sudden he started to crawl. And he just crawled right off the raft into the water and started to swim. And we couldn't hold, we couldn't stop him because we couldn't move. We didn't know that at okay. the time. And like the doctor had told us later, he says, you guys were shutting down. Your body wasn't going to give blood to your arms and legs anymore. Just keep your innards warm. Um, Elmer said that he, I don't want to say roughed up Gary, but he, he kind of hit him a few times to try to straighten him out from his hallucinations. Do you remember that? No. Okay. No, I don't believe so because I was in the middle, Gary would be on my right, Elmer would be on my left. Okay. So. You guys just did not have the energy to stop Gary, huh? No, we didn't have the energy because it's like I want to raise my left arm to put over there, and I can't. It's like there's no strength in it. And Gary was pretty muscular, right? He was, he was oh yeah. Throughout yeah. the night, what was he saying? Was he Was he kind of... Uh, telling you guys to watch out for waves and well, was, yeah, because we were doing that during the night. We'd, we'd be watching, and then someone would holler, "Here comes one!" And then we'd pull down a little bit tighter so we wouldn't tip. But then we had the sea anchor out too. Okay. And we held on so knowing as we we're going through these waves, we wouldn't get washed off. Okay. Which we could. So, the lookout on the Sundew said that you guys, when they came up on you, you and you and Elmer were like sitting up a little bit and looking out towards the land and didn't see them coming. Well, we were like in a fetal position facing each other and Elmer was facing west. I was facing east because he looked beyond me and he said, I see something on the horizon. And then he kept up, it's getting bigger and bigger. And that was a sundew. And that's when they threw the, they first they put a cargo net over the side of the sundew. And then as we, got closer, they threw a line to us. And I remember watching that line go in the air because that's we couldn't move, couldn't catch it. And then when the raft and the sundew kind of got even, these guys on the sundew, their buoy jumpers, they jumped on the raft. And then when the raft again got even with the ship, one by one they took us and threw us up on the deck of the sundew. And, and Elmer went first, right? Possibly. Okay. Yeah. What was that feeling like when those guys jumped on your raft after 15 hours? <laughs> it's hard to say. It's just that, uh, oh, it comes John again. Did you know at that point you were going to make it? Oh, then we knew. Oh, yeah. Yeah, once we, the Sundew was there, we knew we'd make it. Yeah. So they get you on the Sundew. Do you remember when Warren Toussaint came in? So you get brought back on the Sundew, you and Elmer. Yeah. 
And from what they testified, saying that you guys were like frozen like this. Oh, yes. I mean, yeah. you guys, you look like your hands were clenched. Yeah. And that were. you were gray. And bloated. And bloated. Yeah. So they bring you into the, um, the chief petty officer's cabin. Right. Not into the, uh, um, uh, to the medical part of the, the boat. No. They lay you out and they tore all your clothes off. Yeah. And started massaging you, right? Right. Yeah. Anybody asking any questions like what happened or are they just attending well, to you? Just, well, we talked, then the captain came in and spoke a little bit and he said to Warren, to Saint, he says, when they're feeling a little better, let me know. I want to come down and talk to them. Okay. But we, we kept telling him about Gary. You know, and later on, uh, as we were starting to you know, get warm a little bit, but the problem getting warm, our temperatures are going up too fast. That, that they wanted them to go up. And uh, the captain come down, we told him what happened to Gary and how he crawled off the raft. And the captain said, well, he'd go search a little bit. And he searched and searched. And Warren talked to Dr. Lawrence Green in Charlevoix and uh, told him our temperatures. And the doctor said, they're going up too fast. He said, get them in here as quickly as you can. So they quit trying to raise our temperatures. And uh, the captain told Warren, he said, you're in charge. If anything changes on these guys, you let me know and we're going in immediately. So he told the captain that, and the captain said, okay. He contacted the Hollyhock, another Coast Guard boat, mm -hmm. and he put the Hollyhock in charge, and he raced into Charlevoix. And then when he got us into the hospital, they put us in a cool room and lowered our temperatures, and then slowly built them back up again. They found Gary about 45 yeah. minutes after they yeah, found the, you guys. Yeah, uh, the Transantorio found Gary. Were you surprised that they found him alive? Yeah, but they found him with a, the term they use, a breath of life left in him. So when word got out, this retired doctor on Beaver Island volunteered to fly out there by helicopter. And on his way out there, the Transantorio says that he had passed away. Do you remember being on the sundew and the very first time you got up, went to the bathroom, or looked in the mirror at yourself? Oh, wait, no. Wait, no. Because no. Elmer, Elmer said he had to go to the bathroom so bad when you guys were in the, in, in, on the sundew. He said no one was around. He goes, I got up. He goes, I could barely walk. It was at that point I realized how bad my body was beat up. There was skin knocked off him all over. And uh, yeah. so... No, I don't remember that. I remember, though, that they brought like a bedpan, and our urine was very, very dark very dark and that's when the doctor said because you were condensing inside that okay. was the reason do you okay so you guys are on the boat and then at some point you guys said to them we're fine keep looking for yeah keep looking for Gary until our temperatures started to get too high um they found the sundew found bodies while you guys were on the oh, boat yes right? yeah, yeah and where did they put them on the on they the were, deck they were on the deck, of what I can remember, they were on the port side, because when they were taking us off on stretcher, I could look over and I could see these bodies on my right covered with a blanket or something. Because we got into Charlevoix, the doctor came aboard and checked the bodies first and confirmed they were past, they were dead. Then he came in and checked us before they moved us and then he took us to the hospital. Did you tell me that at one point they told you to close your eyes as they're bringing yes. out the boat? As Who told you that, Warren or could somebody? Could have been or a stretcher carrier. Could have been, I don't remember. But I didn't close my eyes. You did not, right? No, and I thought about that later on. They probably didn't want me to see these bodies mm -hmm. lying there. So you guys, you're in Charlevoix, and they didn't bring you to the Coast Guard dock, right? They brought you downtown in yeah, Charlevoix? Down, yeah, right, right under the bridge in a quick right-hand turn. Right. What... Um, do you remember everybody standing there? Oh yes, all those people around. Oh yeah, yeah. Families, oh, friends, this, like everybody, that. yeah. As soon as word got out, people started flocking towards Charlevoix. Okay, and then from there they brought you to the hospital and you guys stayed about a week or something? I believe it could have been a week, Okay. Because yeah. I, I thought we're, we could get out, you know, come to the funerals, but now I realize why they didn't want us there at the funerals. You know, the, the officials, because it wouldn't look right or something for families. You know, I lost and he survived or something. So okay. that's my thoughts anyway.
but we were they wouldn't let us in the hospital get out of bed by ourselves. We could move and get out, but there were two men, one on each side. If we walked, there was one man on each side. If we sit in a chair, they were close by. Anything I do, they were there for fear that we could fall or stumble or something. Did the company, anybody from the company, how long was it before they came and asked you what happened? Do you remember? Uh, I don't remember that. Okay. The company wasn't very nice. They were not, right? No, no. Because you went to a desk job after well, that? Or worked yeah, they said, you don't have to go back sailing, and I had no intention to do it. You just never wanted to be on My boat words again? were, I have no desire to go back. So they put me in the storehouse in a calcite plant, shuffling papers. On, in 1959. Could you just not go back on a boat? Well, just, I could, but I was married, and Marla says no. I see, okay. You know, so I, I, had, I had no desire anyway. Not really. What about Elvie? Well, we used to chum together, but uh, not too much. Was he married? Yeah. yeah. Kids? Yes. He has one son. He had a rough marriage, too. He did? Why? Yeah. Do you know? Yeah, but... You, you don't want to talk about it? No. Okay. He has, his son lives in Roger City. His name is Kim. K-I-M. Kim Budnick, okay. Kim Budnick, yeah. He lives in Roger City. This guy's brother... Uh, Greensky? Donnie, Donnie Greenjinski. You got a grunt word, green, green jeans ski. Green jeans ski, yeah. okay. Uh, Donnie built my house at Grand Lake. He and I kind of designed it together and he built it for me because Donnie wasn't doing that kind of work. This guy's dad was a barber in Roger City. Dwayne? Yeah, his dad's name was Benny, Benny Berg. This guy's mother would be my first cousin and she was a fisherman, a fisher lady, she fished, picking berries, and she'd come back with berries. Where'd you get them from? Oh, out there. Where's out there? You know, out there. She wouldn't tell you where she went. Oh, really? There. And she would be down at the calcite plant fishing for perch. You get what they call big yellow belly perch. You put two hooks on your line and minnows and drop them in and you catch them. And she would catch him fish. And, oh, yeah. She was... Her name was, uh, her mother's name is Pelagia. You imagine that? We called her Bessie. Her name was Nettie. Her, his mother's name was Nettie. And the other one was Cecilia, another daughter, Cecilia. But I always say to my dad, you know, and it would be my dad's niece, and I said, how come Aunt Bessie named her Nettie? It sounds, there's a lake nearby called Lake Nettie, Lake May. Oh, in my days of love. <laughs> <laughs> Nettie Promo, yeah. What about Gary? You didn't know, did you know him off of work, out no, of work? No, just at, just at work. I just at work. Him. What about any of these other guys? Dick Book from Iowa. Uh-huh. I said to him, I said, what the hell is the guy from Iowa doing here in Michigan sailing? And he knew I lived in Waterloo. He said, what's the guy from Michigan living in Waterloo? <laughs> you know? I told him why I was married. but Dick, He, he uh, just wandered... Dick was a wanderer, I guess. He wandered into the area, and he found a job sailing. So there's a uh, hotel in Roger City called the International. There's a beer garden underneath it. He had a room there or something, didn't he? Yeah, he had a room there in the wintertime, but he sailed. Hell of a nice guy. Very nice guy. Yeah, several years ago, his two sisters came to Roger City during the ceremony, the Nautical Festival and asked if they could talk to me at the Great Lakes Lore in Roger City. Okay. So we did work, and Dave Erickson, you know, Dick was a deck watch, and I was a deck watch. I see, okay. And Gary was on the 12 to 4, and I told Gary, when you wake me up, just open the door and just say 3.30 and go. Don't holler at me or get up or nothing. And he understood that. Just give me the time, and I'd wake up, and I'd get up and go. The, Did he have a beard, Gary? Not that I'm aware of, no. Because when they found him, you, you could, somebody said you and Elmer were like, does he have a beard? I just didn't know if he had grown a beard out that, no, that I fall. Don't, I don't recall. Okay, all right. Now, what about Carl Bartell? Do you know anything about him? No, not other. He's from Kalkaska, Michigan. Very nice guy. If you can yeah. tell by his looks, you know. Yeah. Very friendly guy. 
What he's, do you think? What do you think happened gonna, to him? He was on the bow, huh? Yeah, Carl Bartel would be on the eight to twelve launch. This guy, Alfred Bieber, married a girl. I don't remember her first name. Her last name was Angieski, and she graduated in '48. A beautiful gal, and everybody just called her Angie. They forgot her first name, and oh God! And I, I talked to her later on. She never remarried or anything, you know. Uh, Aileen Bowers is still alive. Yeah. She's. You remember her? Oh yeah. John, John's wife. Yeah, John's wife. She never remarried. No, she never remarried. The other one was Keith Schuler's wife. Never remarried. That's right here. Keith Schuler's wife. Why do you think they not? They didn't remarry because they couldn't. Well, probably that with the idea in her mind, if I'm correct in saying that, in Schuler's case, she said he's going to come back someday with that idea, you know. 